Michael Casey is monnik in de Tarawara abdij in Australië. Als hij in de Sint Adries abdij in Zevenkerken een sessie komt geven, grijpen wij de kans om deze kenner van het monnikenleven te ontmoeten. Gebed, zegt hij, is even natuurlijk als onze ademhaling. Zich bewust worden van deze wonderlijke realiteit, daar komt het volgens hem op aan. Welkom, well, vader Michael. Dank u. You are from Australia, a long way from here. Can you tell something more about uh, the Abbey where you come from? I come from a, a relatively small and, and simple monastery that was founded in 1954. It was founded from, from Ireland at a time when there were lots of monks, uh, but not much money. I think everywhere in the world in the early 1950s there was a fair amount of economic restraint And one of the advantages of that for us was that we, we never built large buildings or a huge monastic pile. Um, but we still continue to live in relatively small, uh, simple buildings clustered around a church and uh, spreading themselves out horizontally as we do in Australia rather than vertically. And what is your task there? Uh, do you have a specific task in the monastery? At the moment I, I look after the formation of those who are in temporary vows. Uh, in the past I have been prior, that's, that's the number two person in the monastery. I also make habits, I do cooking, I look after the library and all sorts of other odd jobs that fall to your hands if you're a monk. Yeah? And are there still uh, young people who are uh, joining the community? About uh, more than a third of our community would have been in the monastery less than in six years. That's to say there are, there are nine people out of a community of 23 and we expect another couple later this year. That's a lot, isn't it? We're fairly lucky, I think, because uh, we have had a good inflow of vocations these past few years. But isn't it so that uh, nowadays it's very difficult for a young men to go to a monastery? It seems so weird in our society. Of course it's weird. That's why they like to come. Uh, yeah, that's the reason. Um, the, the places where they can continue being what they were always were are not attracting them. These are, are generous young men who want to give their lives to God and, and think that the only way that they can do that is in a way that's dramatically different from... Uh, the manner in which they were living before they came to the monastery. The title of your latest book is An Unexciting Life. You claim that uh, exterior dullness is a condition for inner excitement. Mm. This sounds really very weird. Uh, does it make monastic life unattractive? Or well, it's being somewhat paradoxical and ironic, uh, obviously. Um, There is a, a saying in one of the letters of Gustave Flaubert. He says, be, be boring and, and uh, unoriginal in your life, like a bourgeois, so that you can be violent and outrageous in your work. And I think that if we have a fairly quiet life on, on the exterior, then it means that a, a very vibrant uh, inner life can develop that it becomes possible to become sensitive to what's happening uh, on the inside of the person, at the level of the spirit. Eh? Is this the reason why you say that uh, young people who join the community have to unlearn first, uh, before they learn what monastic life is about? That's part of the process, is, is a fairly radical reassessment of the values by which they live. And that means unlearning the kind of socialization which they've, uh, to which they've been subject in the process of growing up. In other words, saying you don't have to be a celebrity, you don't have to have lots of money, you don't have to exercise uh, power over other people in order to be happy. Human happiness uh, is to be found in other directions. And, and that's unlearning a lot because we like things, we like money, we like prestige. We'd love to be in the celebrity pages. Uh, 
How does a monk uh, seize one's own identity? I think the, the essential process of monastic life is, is growth in self-awareness. Uh, initially, a monk, uh, somebody coming into a monastery, learns to do what everybody else is doing and to uh, accomplish the tasks that are asked of him. But after a time, uh, there is a kind of crisis that develops in his life. And he gets sick of just doing uh, what everybody else does and something is, is emerging from within himself uh, which is uh, shouting out and wants to be heard. And I've often thought that uh, the first two phases are of monastic life are, first one is he, a monk tries to be good, but a time comes when he's got to stop being good and to start being himself. And that's a great crisis for some people. It's, it's a, a great adventure, a great bafflement to discover who is this person that is trying to get, get out. I remember hearing a saying of the Weight Watchers that inside every fat person is a skinny person trying to get out. Well, you could say inside every secular person mm. is the monk trying to get out. So you say that uh, monastic life gives the opportunity for man mm. to find God, to find himself. Both of those things, I, I think, that uh, somebody who has the intuition that this is the way of, of further growth for them uh, begins to take an interest in monastic life and eventually the question is that is placed to them is what are you seeking? If they're seeking God then they will find not only God but first of all they must find themselves. So. You write in one of your books that prayer helps you to find the truth about yourself because you are not alone. This seems a very important point, mm -hmm. otherwise you can't stand it, I think. Well, well I think the truth about ourselves is, uh, is something that many of us fear. Mm -hmm. And it's in the context of a prayerful life and the context of a relational life that we can uh, face up to the reality of our own being and who we are and what we are and what we are called to be. And also the fact that perhaps we have been accomplices in our own misery. I think this is a process that is not accomplished in a few years. Uh, is it so that it's something that is during a lifetime? Yeah, well, one of the things that I often say to people is that monastic life is a marathon and not a sprint. Mm -hmm. um, when I was a, a boy, the Olympic Games were held, held in, in Melbourne and the marathon went uh, quite near to my house and we as children like to run beside the marathon runners to show that we could run faster than they could but the fact was we only ran a hundred meters they they ran the full distance and so a monk isn't necessarily a violently fervent person but a person who uh, is long-winded and is able to last the distance and this is the real meaning of, of monastic stability, is that you, you, you book in for the whole uh, race, not only for a portion of it. So write that vulnerability is a is not a disaster. When I read that, I said yes, that's true. But it isn't easy to cope with one's own vulnerability. Uh, well, I, I think the disaster is to deny one's vulnerability. Uh, to deny anything is, that is true is a disaster. But the fact is, if I kick you in the shins, mm -hmm. uh, I hurt you. You're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth of the matter. So if you want to talk to me, you wear protective boots. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> of course, I, I can't wrong, but uh, <laughs> if it's sure I can put on some, yes. But we are vulnerable by nature, that the tree can fall on us, the, the birds can attack us, all sorts of things can happen. That's the truth of who we are. And to deny that and to embrace a, myst a myth of invulnerability is to live in delusion. I think one has to, to let go of one's false trust in oneself. Most of the people that we get who enter our monastery 
are, are not losers, they're achievers. They have high self-esteem, they, they spend a lot of time patting themselves on the back. And, and they're not people that are great users of Kleenex, that are always weeping about life's uh, uh, afflictions or anything like that. They go get them kind of people. And for them to learn to be responsive to the action of God means that somehow or other some of the things that have driven them to such achievement have to go into recession. And that can be very painful. But isn't it also true that uh, growth in one's relation to God is, uh, produces rather paradoxical fruits? Uh, the closer we get to God, the weaker we feel the the more we drink or eat from his presence, the more thirsty and hungry we get. Uh, isn't that something paradoxical? It's, 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 a, it's very strange. Uh, and a lot of people are, are surprised when they read in the Rule of St. Benedict, he has a, a ladder of humility, a ladder of self-knowledge, you might say. And you can imagine a fair amount of misery at the beginning, but you'd hope that by the time the monk had gone up the 12 steps that he would be in a rather high mood of, of self-congratulation that I've finally made it. And yet the, the monk that St. Benedict describes is really a monk who suddenly has deeply internalized the words he was only mouthing earlier on about his own sinfulness, his own need for the mercy of God. And I think Really, monastic life is, is simply a, a sure recipe for discovering the mercy of God. And you discover the mercy of God by receiving it. And you receive it by needing it. And you need it because you make a mess of your own life. And people without a capacity to make a mess of their life don't make good monks. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. If they're too controlled, they've got everything under control, well, they'll be great institutional men and they might get a red hat, but they're not real monks unless they can make a mess. Mm -hmm. So the first step is realizing that we are only human. That we we are, are human, but not only human. Yeah, it's, not only human. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's wonderful to be human, and we ha that gives us a sort of permission mm -hmm. not to uh, expect ourselves to be God. And I think that's the first sin, mm -hmm. is to think that we are God, uh, and that circumstances prevent us from from being being divine, and yet to realize that we are human and therefore in need of God means that we don't have to become depressed because of our own limitations. So. The gap between our secular world uh, sees identity and our monk sees identity. The gap is very large, very big. Yeah, thanks be to God. Uh, I mean, we live in a society which cultivates the myth of choice. Mm -hmm. You have 14 brands of toothpaste, almost identical the same. You have how many political parties, almost identical the same. And uh, we think that by making a choice between one or the other that we are in some way determining our future. And, and that's just not so. We didn't choose to be born, I didn't choose to be an Australian, I didn't choose my, my, my genetic makeup. So many things uh, I don't choose to breathe, the breathing just goes on. I can perhaps stop breathing if you like, but uh, I don't choose all these things. And to think that, that life is the result of my choice is, 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 is kind of megalomania. That, uh, and so I, what I am as a human being is a human being created by God. That's the explanation that theology gives us, that the church gives us, that scripture gives us. I'm a human being created by God, and therefore what I am is in some way derived from what God is. It doesn't come from my choice, it doesn't necessarily and entirely come from the way that society has formed me. But it's what I am is a creature of God. and. I'm created a creature of God with a certain desire for God. I feel when God is lacking in my life, I feel a certain sense of dissatisfaction. And this dissatisfaction is the starting point for prayer? It's the starting point for life. For life. Um, if you're dissatisfied in the chair, you go and buy a new chair. Mm -hmm. If you're dissatisfied with your hat, you buy a new hat. 
uh, and so dissatisfaction shouldn't be something that turns me into a, a victim in which I would passively uh, bemoan the unfortunate situation. It should be something that makes me active uh, to do something to make the situation better. Therefore, I like very much the word desire you use. It's something that you long for, that you uh, feel that you aren't complete. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very beautiful word and it's a very uh, basic reality of, uh, uh, of, of human experience, it seems to me, that we are always stretching out beyond what we have at the present and moving out into, into something which is as yet unknown. And nothing can fill that desire. Even Marilyn Monroe used to have a song called After you get what you want, you don't want it. Uh, when we, our desire seems to be filled, then we no longer want it. We want something else. And to me that's an indication that we're created with a, an empty space within ourselves, a void which only God can fill. I think the, the anthropology that's inherent in, in, for example, the sculpture of Henry Moore, who created so many giant human figures with, with a hollow center. There's something very true about that with regard to the modern period in which he worked, that we, we, we were great and strong and self-confident, yet at the heart there didn't seem to be anything. Uh, and we long to have that void in some way filled uh, in a way that uh, fulfills all our aspirations. Is prayer the way to find uh, the desire or how, how would you say that? I think prayer is the way in which we experience the emptiness mm -hmm. and the emptiness and the experience of the emptiness makes us uh, desire uh, to be filled more intensely. But to get empty uh, isn't that uh, precisely the most difficult thing for men nowadays? Uh, for example silence Silence uh, is one of the rarest things. Uh, uh, why is silence so frightening? I think that uh, we're a little bit like those primitive tribes that uh, try to drive the demons away with drums and noise and so forth and firecrackers. Uh, because when we're silent, then the things that we have kept repressed, the things that are in our unconscious, uh, can come to the surface. Uh, we put earplugs in our ears and fill them with music. We, we uh, are fearful to go into a place where there is no noise uh, because we are fearful of what will come up from our own hearts and our own depths. But uh, monastic life chooses very radically for this way of silence. As a means of discovering, first of all, what is within the heart because monastic life is above all a way of the heart. To find the heart, to, to live from the heart, is, is not only a, a discipline, it's also the, the way to the, the fullest experience of our humanity. When you uh, choose for silence uh, for a long period, you get in touch with your deeper self, and uh, I can't imagine that, uh, that that are always nice feelings you are confronted with. Uh. It's a wonderful saying of, of the English philosopher Alfred North Whitehead. He said, religion, if it passes to its full perfection, goes through three phases. It's the transition from God, the void, to God the enemy, and from God the enemy to God the companion. And I think most people think that the translation is from uh, irreligion to religion, and it's quite smooth. All of a sudden one is filled with love, peace, happiness and joy, and everything is all right. But the, uh, the, the lesson of experience is that's not so. When we're being drawn out of godlessness, out of irreligion, the first feeling is one of dread, of fear, at this strange being whom we're being called on to encounter. We see so many examples of this in the Bible, 
Adam and Eve hiding in the trees. Moses saying, send my brother. Jeremiah saying, ah, Lord God, I'm a child, I can't speak. Jonah gets a jumbo jet to the end of the earth. And Peter says, depart from me because I'm a sinner. And that's... It's in a good tradition when you're feeling that. Yeah. So, so, okay, there's something real scary about confronting uh, myself uh, naked, as it were, before God. Um, but it's the only way to go. Because on the other hand, uh, you're not only confronted with deeper feelings of... Uh, difficult feelings but also with deeper feelings of joy isn't it yeah so that's that's what he says it's only by going through that stage of god the enemy that one discovers god the friend mm -hmm. accepting god as god is not trying to create a god out of my own needs mm -hmm. and that means that i have to accommodate myself uh, to suit um, the totally other who is god isn't that so that uh Becoming a monk is also a process of seeing reality as reality is. Uh, because uh, a lot of people in the world say uh, they make reality as they wish reality would be. Yeah, well, I, I think we're, we're moving into a more and more virtual world. Uh, and perhaps monasteries in the future will become outposts of non-virtual reality. I mean, even reality television is virtual. It's not re reality reality. Yeah. But monasteries, above all, it seems to me, are, are meant to be what you see is what you get. Uh, the, the, as I say, perhaps the last outposts of non-virtual reality. This is human life in its rawest, in its realest, in its most satisfying. And how is the person of Jesus? Uh, is, is he for a monk only an example? Uh, or is he really, as you say, has something to do with the divinization, you call it? Uh... I think there's an important linkage uh, in Western monasticism between uh, a monk's personal attachment to Jesus Christ uh, and his own progress, not only in holiness, in divinization, but also in humanity. And to a certain extent, I'd say, show me your humanity and I'll, sh I'll, I'll see your holiness. People who come to a monastery, um, they don't talk about how holy monks are. They say, oh, weren't they friendly? Weren't they kind? Weren't they nice? Weren't they, didn't I feel at home with them? And I think that's a, a direct result of, of a kind of incarnational uh, theology of attachment to the person of Jesus. And not only as an example, but somehow uh, entering into the mind and heart of Jesus and allowing that to become our own uh, interior basis of action. You use uh, an important word, incarnation. Uh, uh, isn't that uh, what it's all about uh, as a monk? It's, it's precisely that. It's to give flesh to, to something which is spiritual, mm -hmm. uh, to, to embody spirituality. Uh, and you can't do that by becoming an angel. You do it by becoming a human being. And so another title of one of my books is Fully Human, Fully Divine. And there's a bit of a joke there because it's, it's the words of one of the early councils about Jesus who says that he was fully divine and fully human. Well, I'm using it about us. Our task in life is to become fully human. Thereby we will become fully divine. It's a daring starting point. It's uh, something uh, very strong, mm. to put it this way. Uh, but it's, it gives a, a wide uh, open view mm. on, on, on possibility that man has. Yeah, it's very strong and it's very traditional. Yeah. Um, that it's somehow or other we have allowed the idea of divinization to disappear from the spirituality of the church. And we've substituted for it a much, much milkier substance which is being moral, being good, doing the right thing, keeping the law and so forth. And, and, and that's just not as attractive. Who wants to be good?
Saint Benedict advises his monks to become strangers to the city. What's the deeper meaning of becoming a stranger to the city? Well, I, I think the deeper meaning is to give priority to spiritual values. Uh, to put nothing, as he says in the next verse of the rule, to put nothing before the love of Christ. Uh, and then he goes on to explain how we do this by, by uh, restraining our appetite for pleasure, by being at the service of others, by being willing to uh, live in the context of a community, and by uh, being prepared to forgive those who have offended us in many ways. These are not the ways of the world in which we live, uh, but they are the way of, of Christ, they are the way of the Gospel, and also as a monk not only believes but experiences, they are uh, the way to a fuller humanity. How does one learn to pray? Because uh, it seems that the more we try to do it well, the more we try to achieve it, the less it works. Uh, it's, it's not so easy to learn how to pray. I think the worst enemy to prayer is our own expectations. Uh, we have a particular model of what prayer should be like and if that particular experience doesn't follow then we become disappointed. Uh, on the contrary, I think that the only way that we can learn to pray is by, by actually giving time to it and by not trying to control what happens. Most of the time when you pray you don't feel nothing? Well, I, I think that's the education to which we have to allow ourselves to be submitted, that um, when we pray that there is a certain purification of our interior sensibilities that goes on. And the necessary uh, part of that is that um, we experience pe long periods, perhaps, in which nothing seems to happen. And learning to sit through those periods is itself an education in prayer. Now I can give you a, a kind of example of what happens that uh, if you go to pray, for example, in a dark place, uh, a relatively dark place, and when you first enter you can see nothing at all. If you stay there long enough you begin to perceive the dim outlines of forms and after a while you can see quite a lot in that place in which, first of all, you thought there was nothing to see. And the fact is that the pupils of the eye are becoming uh, adapted to the darkness. And I think what happens with us when we pray is that the periods in which nothing seems to happen uh, are periods in which something is being built up. They change our own sensibility so that more and more we begin to develop a taste for the darkness, a taste for the desert a taste for the non-happening, as it were. And this is really the birth of a very deep contemplative prayer within us. It's not nothing, it's, it's the emergence of something which is very strong and very beautiful, but it takes time. Mm -hmm. You need patience. And patience. Yeah.